Shane, Shaniac Schlager, is young, edgy, and opinionated, and he's not someone you want to see at your table. He has been a prominent online player for some years now, and a live player for even longer. His first experiences in poker came when he was 22 years old, when he started playing seven card stud in New Mexico. Over the next few years, he graduated to live hold'em in New York, then online poker, and finally a 10K buy-in live tournament. He played in that 10K event at a time when he still claimed waiting tables to be his main source of income. His biggest official cash to date was for taking down a preliminary event in the 2006 LA Poker Classic, defeating 878 other players for $256,000. Now in reality, he chopped that tournament for about $219,000. That means that his fourth place finish at the Bellagio Cup 3 this summer, worth $232,000, was actually his biggest score. As for online poker, he kills the rebuy tournaments, and he has made the final tables of eight online Player of the Year qualified tournaments this year. He has earned close to $140,000 in OPOY tournaments alone. Shane is with us in the studio today for an interview and to talk a bit about strategy. Alright, so how you doing Shane? Pretty good. Yourself? I'm doing very good. Could be better. Just busted out of the 15K yesterday. So. Yeah, so you could definitely be better. <laughs> Are you sure you're in the mood to do a strategy interview then? I suppose. I don't know yeah. how, how useful it will be, but I'll do my best. <laughs> well, we'll get to the strategy in a second, actually. Um, first, you're kind of really known as a very opinionated person, and I was wondering if you could maybe give us some opinionated or controversial opinions that you have in regard to poker. I mean, I guess the the main thing I see lately that's kind of been bothering me is, I don't know, blurring of ethical lines and just sort of discretion, a lot of uh, table talk out of turn, things like that. And also, uh, you know, I think soft playing and collusion, especially in super satellites, and just there's sort of like a lot of ethical boundaries being blurred and things I hear about that I see and don't like. Um, and really, I think, uh, you know, one of my biggest annoyances in, in a tournament, that's most of the perspective I'm coming from, is just in the post-Jamie Gold era, just how everyone's talking about their hand, and, and there's tons of posturing, and everyone's you know engaging in their own little drama, even when it's not appropriate, and people just don't seem to know what's appropriate at the poker table, and they just want to be there and, and sort of hype themselves up, or you know have enjoy their own little movie, but it, you know, it used to be poker was sort of like a a more quiet, like I remember when I started playing in New York, it was more, you know, people had just more of a, a basic respect for the game and for other players and for the, the rules. I mean, we were all amateurs for the most part when I was playing, but, uh, you know, everyone had a lot more respect, I think, for just the quietness of, that the game used to have than that goes on today. You know, I just see a lot of things that are, are uh, borderline out of line. You know? Okay. Well, so you think that talking about your hand and stuff like that at the table when it's just, like, for instance, when it's heads up, do you think that talking about your hand is out of line still? It, no. Well, in that one specific case, and we have to remember that it really is just one specific case where you're facing a, a, an opponent heads up and it's your decision. If you want to engage in that soliloquy where, you know, we've, we've seen Negrano <laughs> do it, well, what do you have? Uh, you know, if you want to engage in that, uh, that's fine in that one specific situation, which is heads up. But what's happened is now people think it's pretty much standard to just do that in any situation. Mm -hmm. So I'd see, like, you know, third position raise, and, like, the big blinds talking to the third position about uh, how he has played, how he's been playing so far. Meanwhile, there's six players left to act, and they're engaging in, like, some, you know, it's like it's people just, like, try to imitate what they see on TV, and what they're doing is ruining the game slowly, subtly, and part of the problem is there's no real self-policing, like, you know, whereas, uh, you know, coming from New York, I, you know, players would really nicely just, you know, explain to you the rules or, or the proper way to do things, you know, not to muck out of turn, to wait till the, the raise size is declared before you muck. There's less self-policing, and I think there's also not enough of an effort made by tournament directors to really police that kind of behavior, and it's very tough to, to regulate Right. Police. But I, it's it's fairly rampant, you know. People are uh, they love their own little drama, and they all they see is their hand, and and they just want to blurt out whatever they want to blurt out, whether <laughs> it's appropriate or not. You know, it becomes very bothersome and troublesome, you know, uh, from a game integrity standpoint. And I, I, for, uh, the super satellite thing I mentioned, I, it's uh, from what I understand, on the East Coast, it's like an epidemic, just where. At the end of the tournament, the, the regulars will openly agree to collude and lock up their own seats, and it's just uh, a, a total mess. I've heard about it going on in Vegas, too, just 
and you know Lee Watkinson was saying he won't play super satellites anymore and you know I, I don't play them very much but it, it just seems really bad that the, the game can, can foster that kind of widespread attitude that it becomes accepted right well kind of switching gears here a little bit where did the name Shaniac come from that was actually just um, a name an old employer of mine gave to me uh, I don't know. It had nothing to do with anything. I was a bike messenger, and I would just be around the office, and he'd go call me a shaniac. And I don't know, one day when I was signing up for my poker stars account, I was just like, yeah, shaniac will work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, play on maniac, play on shane, and it works as a, you know, poker image, sort of. But it, it, it really wasn't, I, it was kind of not a nickname that I have too much fondness for or anything, just <laughs> something... My boss gave me one day and kind of stuck and still around. Gotcha. Well, kind of keeping with, yeah, you were talking about how you used that when you first got signed up with Poker Stars. How did you get started in poker, period? Actually, when I was uh, around 22, I went and visited my, my oldest friend from New York who was living in uh, New Mexico. They had a card room out there called Sandia Casino and uh, started out playing one to five stud, playing really badly. Um, <laughs> Really no concept of the game, but just kind of treating it as a gambling game. But my friend was playing maybe uh, 10, 20 Hold'em at the time, and I you know, started to learn some concepts from him. But still, it wasn't really for a few years later that I got into Hold'em. Um, I met someone who at the tennis courts in New York who uh, had a connection to the New York Poker Clubs. We became friendly. Uh, it was right around the time of this one club PlayStation, which was pretty famous at the time or it, it, it just it was just opening right then and uh, I got to pr pretty much play there during its prime and even though that was still slow going I still wasn't really a great hold'em player yet but what I started to find my knack for was rebuy tournaments and those $40 plus 30 rebuys that they held twice a week I would start to cash occasionally I and mean, they only paid three or four spots and I would I would start to do okay in those and I still wasn't really a complete poker player at all but I, I Started to show some knack for the aggressiveness that you need to, to, to display in the tournament, and um, then I just remember my friend telling me about Poker Stars, and it was really like a strange, uh, you know, someone in the club, a friend of mine, uh, mentioned that he was going to try to qualify for the World Series of Poker on Poker Stars, and I was like, wow, that sounds like a cool idea. Yeah. So I got on there, I tried, uh, didn't qualify for the World Series that year. <laughs> Um, would have been hopeless if I had anyway. But, you know, and I, so I gradually started playing online poker. I think I got my ass kicked for a while there, too. Um, learned from it and gradually, you know, got better. Became a winning online poker player. Kind of made the move out of that. Trying to focus more on 10K tournaments and or big buy-in tournaments. Uh, just kind of all happened slowly, you know. When I started playing big buy-in tournaments, I wasn't that great either. But uh, just one step at a time, I... Tries to just keep an open mind in every little, every little part of the progress, and just try to become a, a good player at each level. But it, it never like snapped into place at one time and came naturally to me. It was always, you know, a bit of a struggle, trial and error, work, time, uh, you know, learning from your mistakes. A lot of that for me. Well, I heard that you were still working as a um, a server when you played in your first 10K event. So. Like, what is it that caused you, when did you decide, and what did it take to make you decide to quit everything and do poker professionally? That was really right around the, like, it was right around that time that I was considering it, because for the first time I was exposed to people who were doing it. Um, really, it wasn't clear to me until around that time, I'm talking about 2003, 2004, I guess, um, or late 2004, that... You know, there, there were a lot of people who could actually make a living doing this, and they were doing it, and, you know, I was becoming friends, friends with them, and I was learning how they did it and learning that there was, you know, more to it than just gambling and about, you know, avoiding risk of ruin, building a bankroll, and, I, you know, not that I'm the best at that at all, but <laughs> uh, I just saw that other people were doing it, so I started to consider it as a possibility, and I was still waiting tables, and I was still not sure about my abilities or the possibility of, of succeeding in it long term. But I kept playing, and um, I just gradually, I don't know, there was some moment in there when I realized I could just take the leap. I didn't have a big bankroll or anything, but I just figured I was at the place right around the turn of the year 2004, 2005, that I could, you know, really try to make a serious effort. And if it didn't work, you know, we'll, we'll go back to waiting tables. Right. Um, 
but yeah, I mean that Foxwoods event 2004. Uh, I was so so stoked to play. I mean, I, I definitely wasn't a professional yet. I was maybe a couple months away from becoming one. But just the opportunity, I, I went up there on like my day off, won a super satellite Act Three, and it was just so exciting to me to you know get the day off of work and then be able you know the block of time off of work and be able to go up there. And then I bluffed all my chips off to Kathy Lieber. I was miserable, <laughs> but uh, you know that was the beginning of it. And I want you know I wanted to improve and get better, and I realized I still had tons to learn. Um, and it still really took a lot of time since then. I mean, it took me a while before I, I could really feel I was holding my own in, in these bigger, bigger events. Well, and speaking of bigger events, you just recently played in a prelim in the Five Diamond World Poker Classic that we're at here, and you did really well. You made the final table. What did it take to get you to that final table? Oh, uh, it took it took quite a bit actually. I mean, it was a, it was a pretty intense day of poker. Um, I was, if I had to summarize it, I would say I was noticing a short stack. Most of the day, I, I, I pretty much had to choose my spots really carefully. Um, there were a couple of interesting hands. I mean, the real interesting hand, kind of. Two interesting hands took place all within a level. It was, uh, I think it was the 300-600 level. Uh, in a limp pot, I limped on the button with 10-6 of hearts and flopped a gut shot straight flush draw and got all in against a set of sevens. Turned to straight flush. So it was a very beautiful thing right there. <laughs> and for the first time all day, I got up to 50,000. Um, but then right before the end of the level, Russell Rosenblum takes about 35,000 of those chips away from me. Um, he raised pre-flop and I called out of the blind with 10s. I like to just call it was the very last hand before break. And the flop came down jack 10, 7. We got it all in. I check raised and he pushed. I called the second set. He had flopped the, he had flopped the nuts with 8, 9. Um, it's just a really bizarre spot kind of a pretty bad cooler. So that crit, so it was like in this one level where I thought, you know, I finally picked up some chips and then I go on break and I'm back down to 15k. So I pretty much had to work from there for the rest of the day and it was it was really up and down, up and down. Finally right around the bubble I, I was able to pick up some chips and I, I I worked through the bubble pretty well. I had a really good table draw in the bubble which I mean it was just very lucky that all 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 the uh, players at my table were short stacks. Like at the other tables, like Battle of the Big Stacks, right. and, you know, Joe Tihon and, and David Williams going at it. <laughs> and I've got guys who, you know, have like one, you know, one push left. It was just a, a pretty good spot. So I was able to, you know, maintain my stack and accumulate a little bit. Um, but th I mean, from there, I didn't, again, I, you know, I didn't, unfortunately, nothing really came together. I, I was in a couple of big pots at the end of the day to get some chips, I had pretty good equity in and I didn't win. One in particular um, with a pair of 10s versus ace-jack and ace-queen preflop um, and another one where I had ace-10 versus ace-6 all in preflop for a big pot and we chopped that. I lost with the 10s, uh, chopped with the ace-10 versus ace-6. Both of those pots would have been really crucial to go into day two. And then now, of course, I can't complain. I mean, I'm not complaining, don't get me wrong at all. Uh, Day two, I get, like third hand of the day, I suck out on JC Tran with ace queen versus ace king, um, doubled up to two hundred thousand, but really just didn't couldn't get anything going past you know two hundred two hundred fifty thousand. I mean, you say I did well eighth. It's unfortunately not you know it's more of a symbolic victory. It's like right. uh, I played a light schedule here, five events, and uh, eighth place is break even for the trip. Right. So. I mean, and, you know, first place is really life, pretty much life-changing, 500K, you know, life-changing. Right. It's uh, it's big money, and uh, it's a big difference between eighth. It, it just helps to highlight the absurdity of playing <laughs> tournaments. Um, you know, you just need a lot of things to go right, and if you want to see that, and you need that real money to, you know, you need those top three spots. Um, it's nice to know that you're playing well enough to put yourself in a position to get there, but without getting there, you know, it doesn't pay the bills, so. Absolutely. Well, do you prefer live tournaments now, or? Uh, definitely. Um, I do. Partly because, um, I guess to some extent I feel outclassed online a little bit. I sort of feel like the, uh, the newer breed of, of analytical young players has, you know, surpassed my under technical understanding of the game, maybe even surpassed how much I want to understand. <laughs> um, and... I, I think that you know there's a, a very ambitious breed of online players, and it's it's gotten a lot tougher. Um, I do enjoy the aspect of sitting in my house and playing poker, but what I really enjoy is the live aspect and being able to face opponents. And you're playing a lot fewer hands, 
So you really have to make those hands work for you, and you really have to understand certain dynamics that you can, that don't come across over a computer. Right. Um, again, it's you know I love sitting in my living room and being able to click buttons, but uh, <laughs> in the end, I, I think this is this is more what I enjoy about poker. I think this is what I, why I play poker. It's more you know to be out there and have some kind of contact with people and have to you know look them in the eye and take their chips. Well, and you say that you feel outclassed online. Does that mean that you think that live players are worse than online players? No, it doesn't, actually. Um, I would say it's just that live experience is, is a lot harder to come by. Like I said, you're playing a lot for your hands, and, and you have to, it, it, it's harder to get in touch with the things you need to get in touch with live. So I just think there's a curve that I might be slightly more ahead of live relative to online. Um, and also I just feel, you know, one of my strengths to begin with is being able to understand people and what's going on in their minds, you know, in poker or not. And that's, just, you know, that's part of what I bring to it. Um, online, it's just, I feel like I've, I've tightened up my game a lot and I sort of play a boring, straightforward game. I, I still do okay, but I mean, I'm not having a great year really. Um, in terms of profit online, and yeah, I mean, I enjoy these larger tournaments more for sure. What kind of situations get you into the most trouble in poker? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. It used to be ace rag. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, overplaying small aces was actually a big weakness of mine for a while. But I mean, really, the situations that get me in trouble are when I'm not thinking clearly, um, and that's sort of a vague answer, but it's. It is my. It's. Uh, there's just. It's hard to explain, but you play a tournament, and sometimes you feel cold. Sometimes you feel like you're just not there, and I, it causes me to make a mistake. Is there anything to remedy that? It, it's it's really hard to to put to put your finger on. I mean, it's something intangible. It's like, and the best play, the reason the best live players are who they are is because I think they get to that place more often, more consistently. They know how to find that place within themselves. You know, someone like J.C. Tran plays with a lot of control and like understanding of the complete picture of what it takes to win a poker tournament, and his experience also comes in a lot of handy there. And you know, just going deep over and over is really going to help you go deep more in the future I mean believe it or not you know running good begets running good it's one of those phenomenons in poker it's, it's not really a phenomenon it's because of the confidence and the experience and the understanding of the whole of, of all the emotions you need to be in control of um, I mean it's hard to come up with one specific spot and I, I that, that I do get myself into trouble with it you know um, and probably the things that I get myself into trouble with are also the things that make my game good. You know, I never give up on pots. Now, sometimes that's going to be a bad thing. Um, so it's all about really just being in tune in that moment with what's going on at your table. And, and it, it's, and it, like I said, it's, you know, hard to put your finger on, but it's there, and you just have to try to find it. Well, you said that never giving up on pots is one of the things that you do well, but also gets you into trouble. What are other things that you think you do particularly well at the table? Um... I think um, I'm able to identify sort of what my what's going through my opponent's head and what they're capable of doing. I mean, that's sort of a standard answer. But um, and I'm also willing to gamble a lot. I'm not I'm not big on folding, um, <laughs> and I think that's a big part of it. In in, in especially the you know the, not the huge deep stack tournaments, but like the prelims. Um, I'm, I'm not reckless, but I. I'm not afraid to put my chips in the pot. I feel like making a uh, thin call is better than making a big laydown in, in most cases. Mm -hmm. um, so I just feel like, you know, certain whatever fearlessness or a willingness to to put those chips in the middle has a lot to do with it. And also just knowing enough of the time what my opponents are up to and you know making the right play based on that. But, you know, of course, yesterday I got my money in drawing stone dead. Um, <laughs> With a top pair versus a set, but you know it was a tricky hand, and um, <laughs> Matthew Castarella, I believe is his name, good player, took me out. Played a couple of complicated hands. I mean, it's just, uh, it's it's really tough. To, I, I I really wish I could do better for you, uh, describing what it is that goes on out there. But <laughs> well, no, that works. Okay. <laughs> um. Well, you recently. I'm sorry. Your biggest cash online this year was for. 
uh, close to $30,000 in a $100 rebuy tournament on PokerStars. Do you, can you give us some strategy for rebuy tournaments? I mean, again, you know, I'm, I'm probably not the best on that because uh, there are these kids today who just have the analysis down to attack. Uh, and again, whereas I used to be more of an accumulator in, in, uh, in tournaments, now more of a, I guess, a survivor kind of. I still look for my spot, especially online. I'm talking. Um, I still look for my spots to pick up chips, but I feel like I play online. Um, I, I don't really, I don't really know where my edge comes from. Um, I, I feel like I just play decent deep stack poker, but it's a tough tournament and whatever. I, you know, uh, every dog has his day. Well, <laughs> what, what's your strategy in the first, in the actual rebuy period itself? These days, uh, you know, I'm pretty nitty, actually. Um, uh, There's enough people out there that are going crazy that you can be nitty in those first stages? Well, I mean, no, I'm not super nitty. I, <laughs> I, I do like to gamble, but I I don't frivolously throw money in the, in, in the rebuy uh, period too much anymore. Um, yeah, it's just... Whatever, getting older. <laughs> don't, don't have the energy for it. I, I, I still like, you know, and, and also a big thing is that whether you have 5,000 or uh, 18,000 at the end of the rebuy period, I actually feel it doesn't matter too much. Uh, you know, it doesn't, you still, I, I, I can win the tournament whether I have 5,000 or 18,000 at the rebuy period. So it's really just about making every, every play correct and just trying to make good decisions at the time. And again, I feel it's, it's gotten tougher and tougher for me in these rebuys. Uh, you know, everyone knows how to play these days. It's like aggression and knowing when to stick your chips in is definitely not enough. No, you know, just knowing when to re-steal is not enough anymore. You have to, you know, be, I don't know. Well, here's what I think is a really tough question. A lot of people kind of like to spat out these poker maxims like when you're the first in the pot, you should be raising or you should stay when you're ahead, believe when you're behind, stuff like that that they think is... 100% accurate all the time and I wanted to know what you thought was possibly the most overused or most dangerous of those kinds of things. Uh, I, I would guess all of them. I mean, <laughs> you know, as, as a philosophical starting point or something to think about for a strategy, those all might be fine, but if you're really uh, going to, I mean adhering to any kind of maxim like that totally goes against what I believe in that, You know, in terms of where I find my edge of the table, which is just reading those intangible situations. It's like if you're going to fill your head with absolute things in a game that's so, you know, hectic and filled with luck, you're, you're going to trip yourself up and probably cause yourself to make mistakes. I mean, I remember one of the first things my friend told me was bump it or dump it. And I, mean, I still do believe that for the most part. You know, you should be raising or folding most times in, uh, in a game of hold'em. Um, but, it's, you know, I didn't base my uh, entire understanding of poker around that. Um, one maxim I would say is pretty good, and I betray it a lot, is that you should just never show your, show your cards. Um, although I, I do, I have a bad habit of showing my cards. <laughs> you know, look, I had it, or whatever. Um, but that's a maxim I actually do agree with. Uh, but it has less to do with the poker game than it's more like metagame strategy. Well, what, why do you agree with it, though? What makes you think that that's such a good maxim? Well, I just think um, that... Most people aren't good enough, selective enough uh, to use that information to their advantage, and they're just going to hurt themselves. Um, yeah, that's basically it. It's like it, if someone, if I'm sure there is like a, a correct frequency with which to show your hand afterwards, or to show a card to give away the you know this kind of information or not, and, and that's what people are experimenting with. But theory is that most people probably aren't good enough to make it profitable or get away with it, and they're just giving away too much information in the meantime. That makes sense. Well, what's one move or aspect of poker that you think most people either don't know about or don't give enough credit to? Um, again, I think it's this uh, subtle psychology that um, that can't be described. <laughs> it's, it, it's a, it, to me, it's all psychology and um, presence of mind that... That more so than understanding the fundamentals, or not more so, but just as much. Um, I think what's interesting now, you know, a lot of online players are starting to play in these live tournaments, some with some success, but I think one of the things that is, is a, it's keeping them back is they're putting too much stock in their technical understanding of the game. They need to take a step back and start to absorb some of the other aspects of what's going on at the table in order to really succeed. Because it's not just, you know, numbers and... Uh, 
very kind of hard. Like the dynamics of online poker are, are pretty clear to everyone who has played a lot by now. But live, you really, I really think in order to succeed, people have to pay more attention to just like the mood, the energy at the table, um, the dynamic of each individual opponent, and it's sort of more of a player, player, not player cards game. I guess that's a, you know an oldie but a goodie, and uh, <laughs> it's still true. It's like in a live poker tournament, that's really that's really what it's still about. It's not about um, playing technically proficient. That's not going to get it done. You know, oh. you have to. You have to have a, a, a large arsenal. Okay. Well, that's the last question I have for you. I really appreciate you coming here through this interview. Thanks for having me. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for watching the Online Zone on Card Player TV.